Praise God. Aren't you glad today you serve a God who's all things? Amen. To you and I. Amen. He describes himself as the God of gods, the Lord of lords, and the King of kings. What does that mean? There's none above him. There's none equal to him. Everything else is beneath him. And we love him and thank him and praise him this morning. Amen. Just for that assurance that he gives us. Amen. In living for him. If you have your Bibles this morning, I invite you to turn with me to the book of Daniel. And let's go to chapter 12. The book of Daniel and chapter 12. Praise God. Book of Daniel in chapter 12. Stand for the reading of God's Word. If it'll help you, it's right before Hosea and right after Ezekiel. I would give you a page number, but that don't help you. Daniel chapter 12. We'll go to verse 2. I just want to read verse 2 this morning. Maybe verse 3. Well, let's just start at verse 1. And at the time shall Michael stand up, the great prince which standeth for the children of thy people. And there shall be a time of trouble, such as never was since there was a nation even to that same time. And at that time, thy people shall be delivered, every one that shall be found written in the book. And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, some to shame, and some to everlasting contempt. And they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament, and they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. You may be seated. I want to take my thought this morning from verse 2. And it says, Many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting contempt. This morning for a few moments, I want to preach to you about the day of resurrection. The day of resurrection. This time, and the resurrection just simply means to rise up. And so the time that we're reading to you is known in the Old Testament as the time of Jacob's trouble. And Jacob's trouble would be described to you and I as a time of great tribulation. And so Daniel has received, and if you'll read in the last three or so chapters of Daniel 9, 10, four chapters of Daniel 9, 10, 11, and 12, you'll read where Daniel is given a vision of great things. And Daniel has shown some things. The archangel Michael appears to him and we find that he's given some inclination of what's going on, but then he's told to seal the words that he's been given. And we understand that God did not want to reveal His plan for humanity in its entirety. But what God did give us He gave us enough to know and fully understand that there's coming a day that life on on this earth as we know it is going to change. He gave us enough information to understand that we don't want to be on the wrong side of eternity. He gave us enough information for us to understand that there's going to come one 
that's going to present himself as God. And that he's going to cater into the gods of uh, that are lesser known gods. And he's going to magnify them and worship them. And he's going to cater to all the things that are evil and wicked. And he's going to call the things that are good evil. We find this person, we know him best as the Antichrist. And we are in this period of Daniel, this time frame, that we understand that Daniel is giving us a picture of what is going to happen in the tribulation period. The enemy, the devil, has long sought to destroy the nation of Israel. The devil has a contempt for the Jews. He has always tried to stamp them out, to obliterate them, if you will, to wipe them from the face of the earth. But I want you to understand today that the Jews are God's posterity. As wicked as they are, as blind as they seem in some cases, as obstinate as they seem toward Jesus Christ, God has never broken His covenant with the Jews. That covenant goes all the way back to the book of Genesis that God had made with them that He would never forsake them. But great trial and tests have come the Jewish people's way. I want you to understand something today about the Jew. Uh, A lot of folks like to make fun of Jews. They like to hate Jews. There's people that are born again that seem to have a contempt for Jews. I tell you this morning, that's a dangerous path to follow. Because once again, that's God's people. I don't even joke about Jews, friend. Because I don't want to talk about that which God loves. I don't want to bring trouble on my own head talking about them that God has said they're mine. You can go through this whole book and you can look and specifically that you will not find that God has committed Himself to one people like He's committed to the Jews. Because when nobody else wanted them, the Lord said, I picked you up out of your own field. You were polluted in your own blood. And when none would have you, I took you up. And I made you my own. That made them a target of the enemy right there. And when we come to the knowledge of Jesus Christ and we serve Him as a Lord and Savior, it makes us a target of the enemy. We've been engrafted into the bloodline of Jesus Christ, the Lord. Because I get saved, it does not mean that I am a Jew. I do not change from a Gentile to a Jew. It just means I'm born again. It means I am adopted into the bloodline of Jesus Christ the Lord. And so we are Gentiles today, but yet we have the same privilege in Christ as the Jews do. He loves us. As He's loved the Jew. And He's given us a covenant that He will keep us and go with us even into the end of the world if we will but trust Him and serve Him. We live today in a reckless society. There was once a time when America was known as a Christian nation. But today America has divided herself so much on so many different many religious levels that there's a lot of religious people today but the numbers of those that are born again are shrinking rapidly I want you to know today and I'll say it unequivocally that Muhammad can't forgive you of your sin that Harry Krishna can't forgive you of your sin that no amount of work you do and mercy you give can redeem you of your sin There's only one that can redeem you of your sin today. And there's only one path that can be taken for that redemption of sin. And that is by and through the blood of Jesus Christ. We find today that our society paints a gory picture of the cross. But it just amazes me that we can look at the mess that Hollywood puts out. The more wicked and gory and evil and bloody it is, the more society uh, seems to cling to it. But talk about a man who was pinned to a tree. Amen. Not of man's will, but of his own accord. Amen. That gave his life that we could have life. And we don't like the thoughts and terminology of bloodshed. I'm telling you, there's only one 
person that shed blood that made the greatest difference for our life. And that person is Jesus Christ. I appreciate the American soldier and what the American soldier has done. Amen. For our nation. The blood that's been shed to ensure our freedom. But there's only one that's given me eternal freedom. And that's through Jesus Christ the Lord today. I want you to understand that He's been mocked. He's been criticized. He's been ridiculed. All manner of things have been associated to this man Jesus trying to tear down his character. Trying to tear down the person of who he is. But I want you to understand today his image is still untarnished. Amen. His name is still above reproach. And the blood still works. Oh, they've tried to destroy the Word of God. But the Word of God is still going forth. Oh, what boundless love He has for you and I. That He has promised us that His Word will be there to deliver us, to give us hope, to give us help, to give us ultimate deliverance in Him today. There's nobody like Jesus. Nobody can do you like Jesus. Nobody can keep you like Jesus. And nobody's going to give you a heavenly home like Jesus is going to give us one glorious day. I'm telling you, the devil's painted a pretty picture. The devil painted sin as the ultimate for our life. All the things that feel good to our flesh. All the things that feel good to our minds. And it seemingly feels amen that people are gravitating to it more and more. But wickedness is a bottomless pit. But I can tell you amen by and through the grace of Jesus Christ. He put a floor on wickedness. Amen. He put a stop. Amen. To where wickedness can take you. I'm telling you. He put a stop to a downward spiral. And caused me to begin to move upwardly. Toward the kingdom of God. I want you to know today. There's only one choice to make. And that choice is Jesus Christ. The devil may have lied to you. And told you everything's alright. But it's not alright. Sin will kill you. Sin will destroy you. And sin will rob you of your soul. Regardless of popular opinion today, there is a burning hell. There is a literal hell today. I want you to understand that people are dying daily and going to hell. I want you to know today it's not God's will that any should perish, that anybody should die and go to hell. Amen. But there's a lot of folks that are playing church that are going to hell too. There's a lot of folks that are thinking everything's all right when everything all wrong. If you're not doing the will of God, if you've not submitted to the Word of God, if you're living in sin, indulging yourself in sin and partaking of sin, you're not right with God. Amen. Sin's a killer. And the grave's real. And whether you want to believe it or not, heaven's real and hell's real. And whether we want to accept it or not, we're going to stand before a great judgment bar. And Jesus Christ is going to be the righteous judge. And Jesus is not going to make plea bargains at the judgment bar. Oh, somebody, come on, stay with me this morning. Well, God's put this on my heart. Amen. I didn't know who was going to be here this morning. Uh, Amen. But this is what God put on my heart. I'm telling you today, uh, Jesus is not going to negotiate at the judgment bar. He's not going to reward good works. Uh, He's going to acknowledge them. Amen. That are washed in the blood of the Lamb. Oh, come on. Somebody help me today. Uh, I'm telling you the most important decision you'll ever make in your life is whether or not you serve Jesus Christ. I'm looking to you this morning church to tell you, amen, that Daniel saw a picture. Amen. Daniel saw a vision of what it's going to be like in the great tribulation. You understand what the great tribulation is? The great tribulation is what takes place after the rapture of the church occurs.
first. What happens with the rapture of the church? It means that Jesus Christ is going to take those that are saved, alive and well, those that are saved, and He's going to rapture. Rapture means to be called away. It means in the moment, in the twinkling, uh, in an instant, uh, Jesus is going to rapture those that are born again out of this earth, and there's only going to be those uh, that are wrong with God left on the face of the earth. He's going to separate the contenders from the pretenders. Uh, he's going to separate the just from the unjust. Uh, and when Jesus raptures the church away, there's two things that's going to happen. Uh, first of all, uh, He's going to take His restrainer off of this earth. What is the restrainer? The restrainer is the power of the Holy Ghost uh, that holds Satan at bay. That keeps Satan from unleashing his fury upon this earth. Uh, the second thing is, is that the Antichrist is going to r- rise up uh, and he's going to create a reign of terror. Oh, the Bible says that the first three and a half years of the Antichrist uh, is going to be peace. Amen. What's going to happen? Uh, he's going to broker a peace deal among the nations. Uh, he's going to gain his notoriety. Uh, he's going to gain his foothold. Uh, but he's going to be inspired by Satan himself. And at the three and a half year mark, he's going to change. And he's going to unleash hell on earth. He's going to unleash the fury of wickedness upon this earth. And he's going to persecute. And he's going to change everything that you ever imagined. And wickedness is going to rule and reign. There's going to be bloodshed. There's going to be torture. There's going to be murder. And nothing's going to be done against it because of his power what's he going to do he's going to introduce the mark of the beast that mark that says 666 Bible teaches us that that is the number of man and the antichrist is going to mandate that if you buy or sell that if you have any capacity to deal in business dealings or support your family or support yourself, you're going to have to receive the mark of the beast in your forehead or in the palm of your right hand. And the Bible says that when you receive that mark of the beast, 666, you have condemned your soul to hell. There is no redemption. There is no repentance. There is no remorse. There is no going back. Your faith is sealed. You will be reprobate. Unchangeable. Those that refuse the mark of the beast will be persecuted. Those that name the name of Jesus Christ, because this folks going to be saved in the tribulation period, and it's going to be one of the hardest things they've ever done, because of the levels of persecution. But there are those that are going to come out of the great tribulation that survived and trusted in the power of God to keep them. But that Antichrist is going to wreak havoc. He's going to. Uh, make himself known. He's going to come and change the temple. And it's known as the abomination of desolation. He's going to take that which is holy and make it corruptible. He's going to pretend himself to be God. But I want you to understand, Jesus said that He's only going to be given a time to do these things. And at the end of seven years, uh, there's going to be hell on earth. Uh, The Bible says that there'll be wars and there'll be so much bloodshed that the blood will run to the horse's bridle. That it'll take seven months to bury the dead. I'm talking about uh, that they'll pay people just to go and bury the dead people for seven months. It's going to be terror. But I want to assure you this morning that that's not the greatest terror. The book of John in chapter 5 and verse 29 tells us that there's going to be a resurrection of the living and a resurrection unto damnation. 
What are you saying, preacher? That there's going to be a resurrection. I read to you this morning out of Daniel about a resurrection. But the dust of the earth is going to give up the dead. And those that have lived in Christ, they're going to be welcomed into the kingdom of God. But those, amen, after the resurrection of living, the resurrection of the dead, they're going to be condemned to an eternal lake of fire. I want to tell you about hell this morning. A lot of people have glorified hell. A lot of people don't worry about hell. What if I go to hell? I don't care. You'll care when you get there because hell's a place of weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth uh, where there's misery and torment forever, where the worm dieth not. It's a place of hatred. Uh, it's a place of spite. Uh, there is no love. There is no compassion. There is no relief in hell. There's not even a momentary relief in hell. The Bible tells us that hell is a place that burns where the fire and flame die not. But listen, hell's not going to be the worst of it all. Because at the end of time, the Bible says that God's going to take hell and the devil and all that that are attached to him and he's going to cast them into a burning lake of fire. So the burning lake of fire is going to be worse even than what hell is. And that burning lake of fire is going to be cast into an eternity where it's forever and ever. You see, there's some folks who believe, well, when I die, I'll just go to hell. But after a time, I'll, my soul will just fade away and hell will be done. No. The Bible tells us that hell is a place that abides forever and ever. It's like ragu, it's in there. Hell will never go away. I want you to understand today that this awful picture of what it is that Satan has dressed it up. You hear Hollywood say we're going to have a big party in hell. You hear actors say in their movies, uh, hey man, when they're in a climatic scene, uh, they said, I'll see you in hell. Oh, I don't want to go to hell. I don't want to see nobody in hell because Jesus didn't die. Hey man, in vain for people to go to hell. But I'm going to tell you today, Jesus hadn't sent one soul to hell. It's your choice. It's your choice. It's your decision. Uh, you decided it. Uh, he just acted on what you did. Uh, don't blame God. Amen. For people dying and going to hell. God gave a complete sacrifice. God gave a sufficient sacrifice in the person of His Son. Jesus Christ the Lord. It's not His fault. He's done everything in His power. Amen. To get you to embrace Him. To get you to live for Him. To get you to love Him. But there are those that will not forsake the way of evil. But I want you to understand that eternity is coming. I want you to understand there's a resurrection coming. And you may say, well, I'll get away from His voice and I won't have to think about this no more because He's crazy. I don't believe that. Yeah, that's just what the devil wants you to do. That's just what the devil wants you to walk in the vanity of your own mind. The devil wants you to walk along and think that everything's just hunky dory. Come on. Tell it. But I want you to understand the testimonies of old. There are people, amen, before they started sedating people, amen, on their deathbed. There are people that were lost, that would begin to scream. And you know what they would scream? They'd say, Somebody help me. They said, My feet are burning. 
I feel a fire of hell burning my feet. And they'd slip out into eternity feeling the fire of hell before they ever took their last breath. I'm telling you it's real. But on the other hand, there are those that have been laying on that deathbed. Amen. That have lifted their hands up to heaven. And they saw the gates of pearl opening wide saying, Come Jesus. Come Jesus. That the angel of the Lord, amen, had come and took them to a oh my God, I feel the morning. I feel the power of God here. I'm telling you, there's going to be a resurrection. Which way are you going? You're not just going to the dirt. You're going to a destination. You're either going to a land of peace and joy and love, or you're going to a land of hate and despair. That's right. Oh, tell us, come on. Tell us back in life's choice. I don't know what it is that people like to see how much they can taunt God. Come on. I don't believe in God. Sure you do. If you didn't believe in Him, you wouldn't tell me you didn't believe in Him. You wouldn't acknowledge Him if you didn't believe in Him. If you didn't know what He existed, it wouldn't be a big deal to you. But you want to push Him aside. But what about that God when you're in trouble? What about that Jesus when your back's against the wall? When you ain't got nowhere else to go? And here's the words. I've done it myself. Jesus, if you'll help me with this. I'll do this. But how many times has Jesus helped you do what you needed and you didn't? You went back on Him. You lied to Him. You don't play games. Because I'm going to tell you something. The book of Romans teaches us. I believe it's chapter 1. The book of Romans teaches us that there will come a time when God turns people over to a reprobate mind. What are you saying, preacher? There will come a time when God will close the window of redemption on your life. And He'll determine you to be a castaway. Forever and ever. And He won't never look your way again. I know what I'm preaching is heavy this morning. But we're living in a heavy time. We're living in a heavy hour. And as far as I know, it seems to me that people are getting more and more afraid to preach against sin and preach against hell and preach against the devil's devices because we're afraid of what somebody's going to say. Listen, whatever you say about me is whatever you say about me. But what you will say is He told me the truth. Because I can find it in the book. Listen, amen, our children are being taught that homosexuality is all right. Homosexuality is not alright. Homosexuality is an abomination to God. Always has been, always will be. And homosexuals don't go to heaven. Only, amen, redeemed ones that have forsaken their way and changed their way and stopped that trash go to heaven. Drug addicts don't go either. You want to know who don't go? Open up your Bible to Revelations chapter 21 and look at verses 7 and 8. Ah, Jesus gave us a good list. Amen. Of of candidates. Amen. For hell. I'll read it to you. I'll save you the time uh, of going there and looking for it. I'll read it to you. Revelations 21, 7 and 8. Uh, He tells us this. John writes it. He said, He that overcometh shall inherit all things. I will be his God and he shall be my son. Listen to verse 8. But the fearful, the unbelieving, the abominable, the murderers, whoremongers, sorcerers, idolaters, liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone which is the second death. Oh, I got you there, preacher. He didn't say nothing about homosexuality. Sure he did. He said the abominable. Because that's how he listed it. All this 
I want to be a boy instead of a girl and a girl instead of a boy. God didn't make mistakes with your DNA. You got one or two chromosomes. I'm fighting here. God didn't make a mistake. Sin is compelling people to go down a road that God has forbidden. That road is just as forbidden as the, uh, as the tree that Eve, Adam and Eve partook of in the Garden of Eden. What did it do? It got them cast out of the Garden of Eden. I'm coming, I'm coming to tell you this morning, God does not tolerate sin. God does not toy around with sin. God paid a great price, amen, for you and I to be with Him, amen, and He wants to love you, to help you, to repent deem you to call you his own but we're going to have to submit to the ways of God these nickel and dime preachers amen that's just telling you the good things and telling them you can live in sin and still go to heaven I'm telling you they're false prophets they're wolves in sheep's clothing I'm telling you Jesus said it best my God that only the pure in heart shall see God There's coming a resurrection. There's coming a day. Come on, brother. Oh, let us consider. I'll be sensitive to your feelings here, Tori, but I'm going to say this. That Wednesday night back in March, when Jesse sat in my house about 10.30 that night, and he said, Preacher, he said, he said I, want, I want to talk to you. He said these words to me. He said, I finally figured it out. He said, I, I, I know what God wants me to do. He said, He wants me to be a missionary. He wants me to go to the gas station because I was at the gas station the other day and I saw the homeless. And God spoke to my heart. And he said, they need me too. And I want you to be that one to go to them. I want you to go into the bridges, to the gas stations. I want you to go to all these places in the highways and the hedges. And I want you to tell them about me. But what Jesse didn't know about 820 the next morning, Jesus was ready to promote him. He didn't know that his dream of being a missionary for Jesus Christ was fixing to be cut short and he was going to be translated to glory. What am I saying to you? Your age don't matter. It don't matter if you're in the prime of your life. It don't matter if you're in your elder years. It don't matter if you're just a young child. Eternity is lurking. Eternity is looming. Amen. We've got an appointment with Jesus Christ. My God. Hmm. Oh, you're not hearing what I'm saying this morning uh, because I am saying we don't have an appointment with the devil. We've got an appointment with Jesus Christ and he's going to appoint us to heaven or to hell. My God. I got friends of mine that died while we were in high school. I got friends of mine that have died coming along in life. What I'm saying to you today is that the greatest thing you can do is make your calling and election sure. Oh, the devil's telling you you're having too much fun. How's that working for you? When you lay your head on your pillow at night and you're miserable, you can't sleep. You look like a raccoon because your eyes are so dark because there's no peace in your heart. You're seeking out drugs. You're seeking out alcohol. You're seeking out devices of the enemy because you're looking for something to get you away from the torment that is in your mind. How's that working for you, huh? How's that going for you? That you can't find no peace no wherever you look. That you're always uh, looking for something else. But can I introduce you today to the Prince of Peace? 
my God, he'll see, he'll take your trouble, he'll take your trial. He said he'll bear your burden. I, hallelujah, that he'll walk with you and take it step for step. You'll be able to lay your head down in the midst of the camp of the enemy and sleep in peace because the Lord is with you. I'm telling you, if God is for you, can't nobody stand against you. He can take that desolation and give you fulfillment. It's coming a day of fulfillment. It's coming a day of judgment. It's coming a day of resurrection. Well, so what if I do live my life? Just Amy was telling me just yesterday, this lady that we know in Alabama, one of the churches there in Alabama, she lived a, she lived a, a risky life. And Jesus saved her from that life. And she's turned into just one of the best people you'll ever meet in your life. A good, meek spirit. A woman hungry for Jesus. But her past, it's still, it's there. That's the thing about your past. People don't forget your past. Jesus does. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. She was estranged from her children. And when uh, she got saved and got her heart right and got rooted and grounded in Jesus, she tried to reestablish her relationship with her children. And they didn't want to have anything to do with her. Because of the road that she'd been down. Well, her daughter, I don't know if it was the youngest or the eldest, but her daughter was living with her dad. She got in trouble and her dad kicked her out of the house. And where'd she go? To mama. And what did mama do? Mama took her in. And mama began to try to work with her and try to help her. Try to. You know, show her the right way, but she didn't want any part of it. And she started giving mama trouble. Started giving mama problems. And so she asked her mama to do something. She said, we don't do that. She said, we got enough of other things that we don't do that. And she pulled a knife on her mama. And this is all recent. This has just happened. She pulled a knife on her mama and she told her mama, she said, I'll cut your throat. If you don't do what I want to do. So her mom called 911. And then the police showed up. The paramedics showed up. She's bipolar. They took her to the hospital. And they run some tests on her. And you know what they found out? How old was she? 37. 37. 37. 37 years old. And they gave her just weeks to live. Her body is devastated by cancer. Her whole body is consumed with cancer. And it started with a little mole. Just a little teeny itsy bitsy mole. Melanoma. And now her body is racked with cancer. Now, let me put it to you this way. She's just got days to live. Unless God intervenes. You know why she disregarded all that stuff? Because she was seeking the party life. Hooked on drugs. Hooked on the things of the world. Hooked on all these things. Neglected herself. Abused and punished her body. She gave her body hell. And if she don't get right, her soul's fixing to get hell. Come on. 37. You want to know what drugs will do for you? Drugs will kill you. You know what alcohol will do for you? Alcohol will kill you. You want to know what being a gang member will do for you? It'll get you killed. Look, I've been as direct as I know how to be this morning. Sin's fun while somebody's there to pay the bill. 
But when the sin gives you the check, you ain't got enough to pay it. Only Christ. Tell us, brother. That was a problem with the old sacrificial system. That was a problem with the shedding of bulls and goats. Is that the shedding of bulls and goats could not pay the penalty of sin. It was an imperfect work which led to an unperfect eternity. That's why it took Jesus. When Jesus died, He paid the full penalty of sin. There's nothing left over. I want you to think about it day 37. How would you like to be in her shoes and know that you just got a few days left? No hope of growing old. No hope of happiness. No hope of seeing a life turned around unless God intervenes. Gone. Gone. And you know what? It could happen to you and me. We're not promised anything. I know we think people ought to live forever, but God hadn't destined us to live forever. He put an expiration date on our lives. Yes, yes. What you doing with your life? When the resurrection comes, what's it going to determine about you? You say, well, Brother David, living for Jesus is hard. It's no harder than what you make it. So you don't have to do nothing to be a sinner. You don't have to do nothing to be wicked because you're born that way. But you've got to make a choice and you've got to make a commitment to live for Jesus Christ. And that commitment to live for Jesus Christ, it takes us away from the majority of the things that the flesh desires. But I don't, the only regret I have about being saved, I got one regret. Just one. I waited too long. Jesus would have kept me from a lot of trouble if I'd have served Him earlier. There would have been a lot of things I'd have never experienced, a lot of things I would have never known, and a lot of things I'd have never been tempted with. If I hadn't indulged in them in sin. There it is. There it is, brother. Help us hold it. But now I'm like a dartboard. The enemy just going. Here's this one. Here's that one. You remember this? You remember that? Yeah. Jesse is fire talking. You heard about them, brother. You know what I tell him? I say, yeah, I remember it. Why do you think I got saved? Put the blood there, brother. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I remember where I was. Why do you think that I listened to Jesus that last time He called? I don't want to go back to you. But I broke up with you and it was a forever breakup. With no hope of reconciliation. I got hooked on Jesus. And it was the best thing that ever happened in my life. Yeah, I've had struggles. Yeah, I've had trials. Yeah, I've had up and downs. Yeah. I've had my frustrations. But I've never been frustrated with Jesus. Yeah. When I pinpointed it, it always came back to me. me, me, me. It'll always come back to me. Come on, brother. When I let things happen when I know a way they shouldn't happen. Bless the Lord. There's going to be a resurrection one day. Tell us a better way, brother. But Jesus said, I've given you life. Yeah. And He only gave me life here, but He gave me eternal life. He gave me a life that I'm going to live in glory one day. Yes, huh? brother. I'm going to get to live in a brand new city. Hallelujah. Listen to me. I'm, I'm fixed to find a parking place. 
I'm going to live in a brand new city. You know what city that is? It's called the New Jerusalem. It's the city that John saw coming down from God out of heaven. See, this earth, he's going to clean this earth up. And he's going to set a new city. And you know who's going to inhabit it? The redeemed. The blood washed. He's given us a brand new place. As if heaven weren't good enough, he said, I'm going to give you a brand new city. I love you that much. Everything about that's going to be brand new. And I ain't just talking about the city either. No more aches, no more pains, no more frustrations, no more heartaches, no more hurts. It's going to be peace and joy. And it's going to be a place where there is no want. Because we shall be completely satisfied in Jesus Christ the Lord. I'm telling you, there's a resurrection coming. That everybody is going to stand before that judgment bar of Jesus Christ the Lord. There's going to be no exemptions, no exceptions. Please make sure you're calling in your election sure. Please make sure that you've taken care of business in your heart. That you're not living for Jesus in name only. There it is. But you're living Him for Him because you've committed your heart to Him. Come on, right there. And your heartbeat is the very person of Jesus Christ. He's coming again. He's coming again. Watch the news. They'll tell you without saying it, Jesus is coming again. You realize our military is predicting that we're going to be at war with China in less than two years? In less than two years. We're going to be at war with China. Are we ready for the things to come? The Bible tells us that in the last days there's going to be perils. There's going to be trials. There's just going to be all kinds of things going on in the last days. And we're here. You see it. There's everything but peace. It seems that nobody can be content anymore with what Jesus is. Never enough money. Never enough things. Never enough time. Never enough this, never enough that. We can't be satisfied. And it's a mark of the end times. Look, church, I'm just going to give you a piece of friendly advice. We better find that satisfaction in Jesus Christ. We better find our hope and cleave to it with everything that we got and not let the enemy wrestle away our hope in Jesus Christ. Let's all stand together. If you've got toxic people in your life that are keeping you from serving Jesus Christ, you need to get, get away from them. You wouldn't drink poison. We'll have a poisonous relationship. Your soul, you remember it. I want you to look in your hand. I want everybody just to look in your hand. Go ahead. Come on. I ain't asking you to do anything hard. Just look in the palm of your hand. The psalmist said you hold your soul in the palm of your hand. Think about it. You're holding your fate. You're holding it. What are you going to do? Nobody else is going to determine your path. Nobody else is going to determine your relationship with Jesus Christ the Lord. It's going to be you. You. You're going to be the one that stands before Him for yourself. Won't be nobody else to blame. Won't be nobody else to point to. Because the question is going to be, well, why didn't you? I gave you the opportunity. I called you. I pleaded with you. Come to allow me to touch and change your life, but you would. Eternity's coming. Resurrection's coming. Every head's bowed and every eye's closed.
Father, I've done my best this morning to preach a word. Lord, we're living in perilous times. It's dangerous out there. People don't respect life. They don't respect one another. They don't respect you at all. It seems like iniquity is abounding on every hand, but I'm glad to report that grace is still greater, that grace can break the bonds of iniquity, that grace can break the chains of sin, that grace, that the power of Jesus can set captives free if they'll just call upon your name. Lord, if there's one here today that doesn't know you as their Savior, if there's one here today that is bound, there's one today, Lord, that is fighting, grappling, Lord, with different things and they need you to help them, I pray today will be the day of deliverance. I pray, pray today will be the day that you break those chains, Lord. We're opening up the altars this morning. Your altar's open to everyone and anyone. You may need Jesus as your Savior. It's open to you. You may need Jesus because you're struggling in the faith. It's open to you. You may need the Lord because you're in the midst of a battle. It's open to you. You just may need to give God thanks and praise. It's open to you. Come. Find your way to this altar this morning. Don't wait another day. Don't wait another moment. Allow the Lord Jesus.